Then telefilm. In the winter of 1937-38, three mortal vortices crossed and seethed in the snowy faces of Kolomar's gold fields. The first vortex was Berzin. It caused the arrest and shootings of many thousands of people, both the voluntarily enlisted and the convicts. The second one, called Garanin, carried out the endless shootings. Days and nights for many months, the countless orders for shootings were announced during the checkups, accompanied by the inmate musicians, even in 50 degrees of frost. Each list ended with the words, the sentence has been executed, Colonel Garanin. In keeping with Stalin's tradition of those years, Garanin himself was also seized, arrested, and killed. The third vortex was the mass mortality of hunger, beatings, and disease. It took more prisoners' lives than the first two put together. to face. Film two. Coloma's winter. Can you imagine what Coloma's winter is? Coloma, Coloma, you are a wonderful planet. 
12 months a year, it's winter. The rest of the time, it's summer. By November, it was already 40 degrees below zero. There was a rule, work was to be canceled if the temperature was lower than 50 below. But none of the inmates ever saw a thermometer. It was the authorities outside the barbed wire who decided what the temperature was and whether we had to start working or not. But we had our own thermometer. We knew that if we heard a clinking sound when we exhaled, then it must be lower than 40 below. And if we couldn't see the face of an approaching man clearly, that meant it was less than 55 below. In such frost, there was an absolute fog. The larches split and cracked from the frost. It was terrible. We weren't allowed to approach the fire for 12 hours. The guards were in sheepskin white coats, fur mittens, and good felt boots. Moreover, they worked in shifts. And we stayed as if under interrogation. Stomachs were empty, bodies were half naked, fingers and toes were frostbitten. One out of ten of us had a frostbitten nose with gaping nostrils. And the guard's orders were, any step to the side is considered to be an escape. For those lacking a mind or a heart, power over people's lives was a great temptation. Those people were different. There was a young guard. On his first day, he saw his father in the camp. They were led out of the zone through the gates in groups of five. It was a black mass of faceless, exhausted people who could hardly move their feet, wearing hats made out of old wadded jackets, boots with wooden soles. Believe me, I was an eyewitness. I saw it myself. So the guard saw how his father looked, and the next day he shot himself. Svoyeva Nina Vladimirovna, born in 1916, has been on Koloma since 1940, a doctor voluntarily enlisted. They found a letter to Stalin in his pocket. It said, I can't live anymore after what I saw. I know him to be the most honest man. It was a misunderstanding. Save him, help him. I leave this life, for I cannot guard my own father. People were expecting changes that year. Yezhov was exposed. But an Omberia came to power and brought amnesty for convicts. Koloma got a new leader. The ex-leader, Pavlov, was awarded the Order of Lenin and sent to Moscow. Nikishov, the head of Dolstroy, became the honored worker of the Cheka, fully decorated. But the amnesty given by Beria didn't affect the convicts of Article 58. By the end of 1939, the camp's population was over one million people. My husband was a mining engineer. He was sent to Kolomá and we moved to the gold mine to Mani at once. I was quite a young girl. I ran out onto the steps one morning and saw the camp's fence with the barbed wire and watchtowers. And a column of people was moving along in complete silence, escorted by guards and their dogs. 
One could only hear the shuffling of their feet. Vasilyeva Ludmila Nikitishna, born in 1918, was on Kolomov from 1938 to 1952, voluntarily enlisted. There was no difference between the young and old. Their faces were gray, quite colorless, like their dirty gray clothes. You know, as they passed by, I ran back into the house. I was out of my mind. I dropped on the bed. I cried. I went into hysterics. Mommy, why did you let me go? Mommy, I don't want to stay here. I'm afraid. Little by little, I got used to such a life. I remember, as I was looking out of the window, I saw fog, frosty gloom, and some figures digging in the garbage cans. It was unbearable. They made us, the women, wash the gold. Once we were given cigarettes and sent into the mines, suddenly I saw the people, like skeletons. They would move, fall, rise and fall again. There was a rule that if somebody carted so many wheelbarrows, they would receive a cigarette. You know, I was simply in shock. When I saw all that, I left everything and ran home. I cried to the man on duty, Uncle Grisha, give me everything we have. But he said, Mila Nikitishna, you are crazy. There will be big trouble with the authorities. But he brought me bread from the bakery, and I took everything I had from home, and I began to hand this out to the convicts. The guard kept silent. to submit, we forgot how to be surprised. We had no pride, self-love, jealousy, or passion. Those seemed to be insignificant feelings from another planet. In the frost, it was much more important that you managed to fasten your trousers. Adult men sometimes cried if they failed to do that. We realized death wasn't one bit worse than life, and we weren't afraid of either. Great indifference took hold of us. We knew we had a will to end this life. But whenever we brought ourselves to do it, we were prevented by one of those details of which life consists. It was the war. Tin minerals were being extracted from Koloma for the country's war industry. 
The extent of the war effort in Coloma was creating good living conditions for the guards instead of preparing barracks for the frost or providing the camp with provisions and warm clothes. When it rained, the roofs leaked, and the beds were always wet. Garbage worms appeared in our mattresses, pillows, and clothes. After the summer downpour, the real frost began, 20 to 25 degrees below zero. Half-starved, worn-out people, sick, put on damp clothes. They had become frozen on the outside, and they trudged in this frozen armor to the mines to dig wheelbarrows and spades out of the frozen ground. The snowstorm blew up, transport communication ceased, hunger made itself felt more and more, and death became common. Only half of the more than 700 people survived the winter. In spring, human bodies were seen from under the snow as if begging those alive to bury them in the ground like Christians. The inmates buried them for mercy. The authorities out of duty for reasons of sanitation. As a rule, the best representatives of humanity are the victims, and the mediocrities are in power. There are the victims and their executioners. But sometimes, some of those executioners show a human touch. Lebedev, for instance, the commander, he took me with him through Koloma from camp to camp, I never saw any good in him. Total, he assigned me to about 200 days of solitary confinement. However, I didn't serve all my time, as I learned to escape his anger. I knew this man to be a fanatic. He never spared himself. He sacrificed himself for the sake of the gold extraction plan. He always said that one day of the war's expenses could be paid for by one working day in Coloma. He spared neither himself nor others. Some people were different. Among them was a commander of the penal gold field, Kabdra Kipov. Lebadiev deported all the unwanted people to that damned gold mine to be lost in the middle of nowhere. He needed strong manpower there to fulfill the plan and to give the state the additional kilos of gold. For any violation of discipline, people were sent to that place. Kabdra Kipov was a commander there. He was a Tartar, a very modest officer. Nobody knew how he held the post. He would have done better to become a priest. I starved. And although I washed floors in the convicts' barracks so I would get a scoop of food, I never let myself go. Never took herring's heads from garbage cans. I never believed I would die. I had already become a skeleton, 
My body was covered with scurvy ulcers and every movement caused me pain. I had many other diseases. I was sure I'd never survive the winter. But unexpectedly, I got a chance. It was 1941. The war began. The front needed soldiers, and no new convicts entered the camp. Those there had to work hard. Besides, there was a shortage of medics. They were glad to find anybody with even a little knowledge of medicine. And I had been a student at the medical institute. So that became my job. It was the winter of 1942. A group of actors came from the Magadan camp. All of them were inmates. The concert was very good. Then suddenly, Schwarzberg came out on the stage. As the writer said, love appeared like a killer and overcame both of us. His face was particularly exalted. He was quite different from anybody I had seen before. I remember he performed Liszt and Chopin. At the time, I was the wife of a commander of the gold mine, so he was very shy at first, but later put his trust in me. I asked him whether I could write to him. He answered, you know, that would make my life complicated. After the intermission, he performed the autumn song for me. In 1938, he was arrested in Leningrad for his counter-revolutionary activities. He had studied in the conservatory. Everyone saw a brilliant future ahead of him. He was 19. Schwarzberg Anani Yefimovich, 1918-1974, a Koloma inmate condemned under Article 58, rehabilitated. He was moved to the sawmill. The verdict of Article 58 was 10 years of confinement. He was said to be an enemy of the people. Then my friend happened to go to that sawmill and saw the young man there, already dying. He took him to the gold mine and gave him a job in the accounting department. That was what saved his life. Once they went to the club, it was unheated and gloomy, but there was a piano. Schwarzberg told me himself, I went to the piano and I could hardly believe it was there. I lift my hands to my face, study them, and let them drop. I open the piano. Like in a dream, I put my hands on the keyboard and begin to cry. I couldn't play. Thank you. 
1943, I was a medical attendant and even extracted teeth because there were only a few doctors in the camp. Then I was moved to work at the central hospital where a doctor worked called Mama the Black. Everyone knew this woman. I'd already heard a legend that there was a hospital somewhere where there were no fences, no barbed wire, no guards. There was only a young woman, a voluntarily enlisted doctor who worked there. They called her Mama the Black. The Black because she was from the Caucasus. Mama because she treated you as if she was your own mother. In that hospital, patients got fresh tomatoes, cucumbers, berries, and cakes, and many other delicious things that even civilians couldn't dream about. We didn't know each other in Moscow, though we had both studied at the medical institutes. We were almost the same age, and we fell in love. I had a feeling this would happen. I'd never had such a feeling. I could hardly dream of it. Such a love. It was sheer and bright. The proof is our life. Fifty years together. Sheer and bright love. I'd never met such a woman in all of my life. I grew up without parents. I entered the institute with nobody's help, and I graduated. I said I was going to call them off. They asked me, do you have somebody there? I said, I have no one, but I think I'm needed there. It was then that my struggle began. I'm afraid to remember how many operations I performed, how many patients I saw. The guard always told me, they are enemies. The more of them that die, the better. Do you want to be among them? You consider too much your duty. I had a fit of nerves. Then I found myself in the central hospital. Many patients were dying from various diseases, but they didn't want to take food. I went up to such people and asked them, what do you like to eat at home? They named their favorite dish. Our cook, Uncle Sasha, made them exactly what they wanted, and then they started eating. I also want to mention our cook, Uncle Sasha. He had been in Moscow restaurants, a chief cook in Moscow. He was a real artist. Hundreds of people were saved. Our cook saved Shalamov, a writer who was very exhausted. He got whatever dishes he liked. After that, he managed to survive. He got on his feet again and began walking. I don't remember what he asked for exactly. Maybe meat dumplings. A lot of patients asked for those. Shalamov had already been at the hospital for half a year, on his feet. He was allowed to go to the chief doctor's home to rewrite Henry Mann's Henry IV. The apartment was warm, and there was plenty of food. And when he left the apartment, he took a lot of food in his pockets and ate it at the hospital. He was tall as a pole, you know, 1.9 meters high. The camp's ration wasn't enough for him, even for a breakfast. He was a man in dire need of help. There was an indifference which brought fearlessness. This fearlessness somehow saved us from death. Then indifference turned to fear. I understood I was afraid to leave the hospital for the gold mine. Never in my life had I searched for something better than whatever good I had. I was recovering my health every day. The next feeling to return to me was 
envy. Love did not return. Love has so little in common with other feelings like envy, fear, fury. How little need people have of love. Love comes when all other feelings have already returned. Love returns last. Returns last. If it returns at all. In 1944, my brother and I were first captured by the Germans, who sentenced us to death by hanging. But then the Soviet troops came and we survived. They promised us pensions for our sufferings. That after the troops passed, we would be awarded honors. But then they came at night the same way the Germans did. When I opened the door, they acted the same way. They switched on the light, just like the Germans. Examined the bed, the pillow, and the mattress to check if they were warm, just like the Germans. They arrested me on the 26th of October. They wouldn't bring an accusation against me until December. In the meantime, they beat me every day. Kovalov Vasily Ivanovich, born in 1930, a Kolomai inmate condemned under Article 58, rehabilitated. Why didn't the Germans hang you? Did they recruit you? The most terrible part was the trial. I showed them blood-stained shirts. I asked if that was what they called Soviet power. Their reply was, if you were beaten, write down a complaint. Then they announced the verdict. Katerine Siderenko, to be shot. She fainted. Vasily Kirichenko, to be shot. I got 25 years of confinement. Then all of us signed the verdict. But I told the prosecutor, you are judging us as the enemies of the people, but it's not we who are the enemies. The enemies are right behind you. All the investigators were sitting there. And behind them, there was a large portrait of Stalin, six or seven meters high, in top boots with a pipe. He was holding his hand like this. I said, the time will soon come that you'll declare them to be the enemies. In the war's early days, many convicts asked to be taken to the front. They'd rather die there than rot away in confinement behind barbed wire. But those condemned under Article 58 were deprived of this right. The camp authorities could easily give the political prisoners additional sentences, uncovering non-existent plots or plans for armed rebellion. The guard showed more interest than ever in trying to prove that Koloma needed them. Человек ему цены особенно нету. Черт тебя знает, у никакого возмущения не было. A human being. His life wasn't worth much. Strange, there wasn't any protest, as if you really were guilty. Once they put two guys into my cell. I knew them quite well. 
They wanted me to sign a paper saying I was planning to kill the guard and free the convicts. If I didn't sign, they said they'd beat me to death. I just told one of them, if he touched me, I'd hurt his eggs. Can you believe it? He stepped back. So he didn't really beat me. Simply held my legs against the burning stove. I always thought that a human being was a human being, but this was a demon. He could tell lies about you, he could even shoot you down, it was nothing to him. It was a human being who shot at me and another one that gave the order to shoot. What for? Here they are, two men. I, an innocent. He, a man in power. And how can you separate these people? I must say my family life turned out badly. I returned to Magadan. I found Schwarzburg. I must say I acted with great caution because I had been a candidate member of the Communist Party. When I saw him, my soul found wings. We simply embraced and stood standing face to face. We were talking about our feelings and could hardly stop. He relaxed and recited to me, blue blouse, blue eyes. I haven't told my darling any truth. My darling asked me, if there is a snowstorm, would you like me to light the stove and make a bed? I answered her, today somebody from the clouds poured down white flowers. That night, the moon came out in the sky. We hugged each other and stepped aside at once because we were afraid somebody would see us. He said, the most terrible thing in my life is that we'll never be together. You are living in a different world. Even when I'm free, I'll carry the brand of prisoner till the end of my life. And that's why we have no future. I parted with him forever. There were women in two state farms, and they were under strict guard. Both we and they were guarded. If you went there, you got an additional prison sentence. That didn't apply to the authorities, though. The authorities could choose any woman and do what they wanted. But how could I think about women if I could hardly move? I didn't even have... One. Only skin. We drank no milk, we ate no garlic, only the food they gave us. The farms made pickled cabbage and we ate that the whole winter. It was incredible labor. We were extremely exhausted and any disease put an end to our lives. All around we were dying. The horse was working 24 hours a day, carrying dead bodies from the mine. 
There were many haystacks, all belonging to the state farms. When a man needed a woman, he gathered her some food and went there. That was life. That's why there were as many children as mushrooms in a forest. I was born right in the tree felling zone on the 2nd of August, 1941. My mother was condemned. She was serving her sentence. So I was born in the camp's hospital. Little children were sent to the children's home. I'll never forget the sky. We were lying outside in specially made bunk beds. For us, that was an outing. It was a risky step for my mother to give birth to me when she was 40, especially under those conditions. I always asked her, why did she give birth to me? She had hoped that by having a child, she'd be set free. There was a rule about releasing mothers with children. But nothing came of it for my mother. The war began on the 22nd of July, and that rule was cancelled. I was born on the 2nd of August. Mother was left in the camp. Naturally, I don't remember the camp. Popova, Lubov, Alexandrovna, born in the Kolomak camp in 1941, a lawyer. Naturally, I don't remember the camp. But in our children's home, we had almost the same conditions as in the camp. We had a zone with a barbed wire. Our children's home stood inside it. When we took a walk, we immediately saw the barbed wire in the watchtowers with escorts. Our famous watchtowers. I was three years old when I first met my mother. For the first time, they let her see me. I remember they beat me and I hid under the bed. I realized they wanted to get me out from under it, as they usually did when they intended to beat you and punish you. At last, they managed to do it. I refused to go. They pointed to her. There is your mother. I said, what mother? Where is my mother? They led me to the window, and I saw a face. It was difficult to see her clearly. Because the window was covered with snow. A woman cried, Daughter, I am your mother. Take me out of here, they are beating me. She said, I am not allowed now, but I'll surely come to you. Oh God, I remember not childhood games and toys, but the room with chairs and the radio set. It was there that we were given political information and received reports from the front line. And we, children, responded to all of this. The Germans captured a city somewhere. The atmosphere became gloomy. If Soviet troops beat the enemy, we had a celebration and we were even given food. The rest of the time we were hungry. 
always waiting for the call to eat. Nobody paid attention to us. We seemed to be some miserable dead weight that followed our parents everywhere. Should our mothers move to another place, we immediately followed after them. We moved in open trucks, and Kolima, when built, was much colder. So we were wrapped and covered with clothes and moved in open trucks, which were covered only by a tarp to protect against strong wind. As for me, I think those transports were a way to get rid of weak children. Because when they took us off the trucks, we were like frozen packets. Those who survived were taken to the hospital. There, some children died, and it looked as if nothing could be done about it. My existence in the children's home was like a continuous moving between death and revival. We didn't have our own home. Family was always persecuted and suffered from hunger. My father was a peasant and we hadn't much land, a couple of horses and that's all. Our property was nationalized. My father was sent to prison, Solovki, and then to Novia Zemlya. Once he was being transported with a large group of other prisoners and the boat got caught in the ice. The convicts raised a rebellion and disarmed the guards. Our father returned home wearing a woman's dress. He said he was my mother's cousin. Everyone in the village believed him. He and my mother worked together in the fields. But once, when they went to sell some things, he was seized and taken to prison. When my mother visited him in the prison, she was told to gather a certain amount of money, and then her husband would be set free. So mother went back home, sold a horse, and gathered some more money, but not all of the requested sum. And she brought it to the prison. They told her, your husband has been shot. She went out, threw me under the tram, and then threw herself. Only in the hospital did she recover her wits and wonder, where's my child? They showed me to her. Your child is alive but hurt a little. After the hospital, she returned home and then our trial began. They suggested to mother that she get married and change her surname in order not to be condemned and exiled, but she didn't do it. She took my brother and me to the village Soviet and said, you shot my husband, now you take my children. She left us and went away. We were always told that we were bastards, children of convicts and the enemies of the people, children of the camp. I can hardly remember when there was friendship among children. There was an atmosphere of alienation, so to speak. We were lucky to find a corner where we could hide in that no one would beat us. You mean there was the same situation as in the camp? Surely, one could see it quite well. I would like to tell you what I remember. A boy has remained in my memory. His name was Misha. I still can't remember him without tears. He was a very good boy, but he was an invalid. Everybody pushed and insulted him all the time. His legs were bandied. I always paid attention to how he moved with difficulty. 
And though they beat him, he was so mild, he forgave everybody. You know, he became my friend. But he died. I saw his death myself. It was the way we were brought up, I dare to say. It was meant for our extermination. We were given a bath right in the barrack. An overheated stove with the bath on it. We were lined up. That was some kind of a punishment for the disobedient ones. We watched the bathing with horror. One child was bathed and carried out all red, scalded. Only screaming could be heard. Then the second one. Then it was Misha's turn. He took the boy and he began to yell. All the children understood something was wrong. I remember I grabbed the teacher who made him go. I was crying. Don't you dare touch him. So they pushed me aside and gave Misha a bath. He quieted down and they carried him away. I was the next into the bath. I also squealed like a piglet. I jumped in the bath and felt something overheated under me. That was all I realized. All scalded, I was sent back to the hospital. Well, they nursed me back to health there. But I've never seen Misha since then. My little pigeon-toed friend. Tom's church, Father Nikolai, Nikolai Semenovich Titsura, immediately after his release, built a wooden church, the small Orthodox cathedral in Kolema, God's home in the kingdom of death. The authorities closed down that church. Titsura Nikolai Semenovich, born in 1909, a Kolema inmate, condemned under Article 58, rehabilitated. Some years later, convicts erected another temple for Father Nikolai, but it was also taken to become the pioneer's house. About 2,000 priests were in Kolomar. After 20 years in the camps, I came to a conclusion, in accordance with a number of observations that there were people in the camps who could keep true human features despite all of the horrors, hunger, cold, and blows. And those were the sextants and the priests. Of course, there were some good individuals among the other people, but they were the exceptions. 
and very likely they only held out until the last few moments. But the priest would always be human. I found myself at the Khlodny mine. There was an incident. A guard killed his mate. I said, we should exterminate this entire band. We should destroy the Kremlin and instead erect a monument to the inmates of all eras. They came at night, took me away without clothes, barefoot. They took me to the convicts who were in for rape. They told me, hi, dissident. Tell us how you wanted to hang Stalin. At the same time, two priests were thrown into the cell. The Khans raped both of them. One was 30, the other was 45. He was gray-haired. I protested against it, but they told me, Offender, sir, it's not your business. And they raped them that way. I asked them, Where is your God? Why didn't he shield you from this? Soon I found myself on the list of those sentenced to death. I was sent to work in the mine. At the same time I was being brought knives, hundreds of knives, and I was sharpening them. There was an uprising, an uprising against the common criminals. They were killed the same way as in the movies, only the common criminals. I understood that there was an underground organization in the camp. As for me, I had always dreamed about escape. This thought was always in my head. They explained to me they'd set the camp free. I gave my consent and joined them. The main thing was to disarm the garrison, but there were too many guards. My assignment was to prepare the shelter inside the mine. I brought some food, wood, and clothes. How long did you stay in the main? About six months. We waited in the permafrost and darkness. They were looking for us for a long time. The mine didn't work for a month. They sent soldiers in, but they couldn't find us. They poisoned us with gas, but we had medications, food, knives, grenades, and guns. We tried to go outside, but there were soldiers everywhere and had to spend 24 hours hanging onto the overhead cable. The guards with dogs got into the mine. They failed to find us. We had no food to eat by that time. We went outside. We passed the watchtowers. The whole area was lit. If they saw us, I was to throw a grenade. Then we passed through the bushes and realized that it was freedom. Could you imagine? We never believed it was possible to escape, not only from the mine, but from the hands of the KGB. On the 8th of May, 1945, representatives of the German High Command signed the complete statement of Nazi capitulation in Berlin.
That day was much awaited in Kolomar. The victory wasn't only happy news, it was the hope of forthcoming freedom for those who survived. They said, whoever wasn't in prison during the war didn't see the worst of it. People still had hope and faith. Screenwriter Kirill Nikolaev. Director Mikhail Mikhail. Cameraman Andrei Andreev. Sound Natalia Solomonik. Composer Dmitry Pavlov. English text and translation by Anatoly Antohin and Gwendolyn Womack. Voiceover by Daniel Kleinfeld, Liz Hilliard, Sven Holmberg. Brett Levy, and Oleg Kulikovich. End of Film 2